book of okay I, we're all consenting to be recorded for posterity um so this is the fifth book of the torah and as you know each book was separate up until a certain point correct now if you take out i was just at the temple this morning showing someone around and i took i opened the ark and i took out a torah quickly and opened it up which took like three seconds and show and it, it set to the beginning of Devarim. And you can see about four lines of empty space between the end of the book of Numbers and the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. But this wasn't always the case. Now, how do we know that this was not always the case? What scrolls have we found that conclusively prove that things were separate? Pam. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Excellent. Thank you. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found a lot of copies of the book of Deuteronomy, by the way, more than I think any other book. But they have books of Genesis and they have books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. But these scrolls are all found in different places and they're clearly not connected. So not connected physically. So in other words, at the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was maybe 2,100 years ago or 2,000 years ago, um, each book was scrolled separately. So you would have in the Ark, if this was still the practice, you'd have scrolls of Numbers, you'd have scrolls of Genesis, you'd have scrolls of Deuteronomy. But we don't do that anymore. Instead, we have what? Miriam? Oh. Unmute and tell me what we have in the, in, the, in the ark now. Do we have scrolls of Deuteronomy by itself? Mm -mm. It's the Torah. Do we have? Or uh, something else? Torah. Thank Tora. you, Mark. So all five books are combined. And this, you know, whether this is a good idea or a bad idea, I mean, from a practical point of view, it might be easier to have each scroll separate, right? And then somebody who's not very strong could carry the scroll. And you wouldn't really need two heavy sticks. You could put it on one little stick, kind of like if you've seen the uh, scroll of Esther's, you know, that are you know, made like that. And the scroll of Esther, you can buy it on eBay, comes usually with one little stick. And it's, you know, it's small, you know, because it's short. Anyway, so that's a little bit of background about the scrolls themselves. Now, in terms of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, Harvey Fields gives a little bit of background about the modern biblical scholarship view of Deuteronomy. And what is that view? Um, Babette or Riva? What does Harvey Field say about where Deuteronomy came from? Yes, Bernie, thank you. Uh, that some unknown scholar wrote it um, uh, 2,500 years ago, 2,600 years ago. During the time of which king? Josiah. Okay. And King Josiah is a really important guy that you may or may not have heard of. But King Josiah was a Jewish king that was, as Bernie said, 25, 2,600 years ago. And he was considered a big reformer. And he wanted a make Judaism more vibrant. And, and so he or his advisors, according to this theory, they, what did they do to, do to try to inspire people? Don't all answer at once. Um, B, Babette, Nan, or Minya? Don't know. What did he do to try to inspire people? He became king. 
and he said, the people are apathetic about Judaism. What am I going to do? And so this is before Facebook, so he couldn't go on Facebook Live. He couldn't use Zoom. What did he do, Bernie? He got this book written. Okay. He said, what we need is to discover a new book, and then we can pull out the book, and we can use that to inspire people. But we're not going to write it new, or we're not going to admit to writing it new, because new books don't sell well. We're going to say it's an old book that we found. <clears throat> and like our temple library, we have a new member who's, by the way, who's volunteering to reorganize our temple library. And um, um, our temple library, there's books on chairs and there's books in boxes and there's books, uh, you know, it, it, you know, there's no librarian. So the temple in Jerusalem, apparently they had a similar problem and they had a lot of stuff in the closet. So King Josiah pulled out this scroll from the closet and said, look what we found. And what did it say, Marsha? It was a list of rules. It was, I believe that from what I read, that it was a compilation of things that were in other books. Correct. So the book of Deuteronomy kind of encapsulates the, the greatest hits of the first four books, particularly with a focus on practicing Judaism. So it doesn't go into stuff about Abraham and Sarah and about the creation of the world and about, you know, the fighting between uh, Jacob, and, you know, and, and his sons. It, it instead it focuses more on the, the, the rules of Judaism and the practices of Judaism. And it changes some stuff that they felt needed to be changed or reemphasize certain things. And so then they pulled out this book and they said, we found this ancient scroll. We're going to read it next Shabbat. Everybody come. So everybody came. And uh, Reva and I are working on a similar strategy to inspire the Jews in the, in the West Valley. And we're, we're going to, quote, unquote, discover an ancient scroll. <laughs> and... Um, uh, so if you know a good calligrapher, uh, you know. Um, yes. Did I miss something? I didn't remember reading what you just told us. Was there another page that I didn't see page about 95? finding the book? Well, you know, some of what I said is not there, but, but the part that Harvey Field does talk about is King Josiah and this idea that they, they, um, they, they put together this book of Deuteronomy at the time of his, his uh, being king in order to re-inspire the people. That's there. Okay, because most of it seems to be the conflict that it was written by, uh, the, really the work of Moses, not King Josiah. So that's why I was wondering if there was another paragraph in here that I didn't see. Okay, so then theory number two is, you know, the more traditional theory is that it does, wasn't written by King Josiah or his advisors. I didn't mean to say that King Josiah wrote it personally, but rather that his advisors wrote it for him. The theory B is that it is of Mosaic origin, that, that this theory is not right about King Josiah, that it really does come from the same time period as uh, some of the older scrolls, and particularly Exodus and numbers and um, it's much older than the the scholars who argue that it comes from the time of king josiah um so those th that would be theory theory b and that would be uh we would say that would make it of mosaic origin doesn't necessarily mean moses wrote it but that it was older and that it came from around the same time as some of the other scrolls okay does that does that help yes but obviously, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't have a, a scholarly view. I don't know enough to say what I think is actually the truth. But I like the, the idea of King Josiah. I mean, I find that very dramatic. <laughs> uh, but, but I don't know what's true. I mean, it's dating these texts is very hard. Um, 
Okay, comments. Jennifer, Amanda, Leah. Mm -hmm. um, well, doesn't it say in the beginning that it's um, it represents some of the speeches that that Moses had made right before they were going into Israel because he knew Correct. he wasn't going there. Correct. So theory A would be that this was written hundreds of years later in the name of Moses. Theory B was that they were actually transcripts written at the time of Moses' life or shortly thereafter. Um, Marsha Sai, Nan. Reva Miriam. Could you repeat uh, that? Any comments? No comments. Okay, so then we have the setup. We have two alternative theories of when this was written. Uh, obviously, when it was written has a tremendous impact on what the purpose of the messaging is. But either way, these are uh, transcripts or, or near transcripts of speeches that Moses gave toward the end of his life. Okay, would like to read on. Um, Top of page 99, right column near the beginning. Yes, Riva. Riva, and then Minya can read later. Near the beginning of our Torah portion, Moses recalls a moment of crisis when he realized that he by himself could not lead the Israelites. He remembers saying, I cannot bear their disputes and bickering by myself. To aid him, he appoints wise, discerning, and experienced tribal leaders and judges. He charged them to hear out the people and to decide justly between them, Israelites or strangers. I commanded them to be impartial in judgment, hearing out low and high alike. I told them to fear no person in rendering a judgment because judgment is God's. In commenting on the difficult burden of making judgments, the early rabbis, many of whom were presiding over court judges, compare the responsibility to dealing with fire. If you come too close, you will be burnt. If you stay too far away, you will be cold. The art of making judgments, they conclude, is finding the right distance. Okay, stop. Um, so um, what, what is the Torah, what, what's in the Torah that deals with justice, and then what is the rabbinic uh, insight on this. Marsha. What I was going to say when I had my hand up was that I remember that it was his father-in-law who was apparently big into management that he went to, Moses went to about this, who said, you've got to, you can't take this all upon yourself. You have to start giving out uh, jobs to other people. You've got to get, form committees and have other people leading, you know, so that's what I was going to say. Delegate. <laughs> yes. And that is true for our temple as well as for the Israelites in the desert. Although here, the stress is not so much on management, but on justice, right? So um, organization in general is another issue, but here, the focus is primarily or exclusively on disputes and bickering. Now, still, we still. in our temple, we don't bicker ever, right? <laughs> but, um, but if there was bickering and if there were disputes, you need a, a, a system of justice. Remember also that in the ancient Israelite world, there's no separation between civil and religious law. So whether you're ox um, knocks over somebody's cactus or whether you're not sure if the talit that you want to buy is kosher um, because it's got an American flag decoration or something. Either way, it's the same system of justice, the same judgment. Sai. Sorry, you have to unmute. Unmute my side. 
Ty, we're not hearing you. He unmuted, but we still can't hear him. Oh, there he is. Ty, can you can we hear you? Don't You're unmuted, there. but we can't hear you. I don't know why. He disappeared. Okay, anybody else? Maybe he'll reappear. Babette. Well, the thing is here, they're not, they're not um, giving laws engraved in stone, as they say. Um, mm -hmm. It's rules about judgment, which I think is wonderful. You, you know, in other parts of the Torah, you, you can't marry this one, and, and you have to plow your fields this way, and 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 rules for you know uh, thievery and what we just came through if you murder somebody inadvertently but here there is a lot of space for how one judges um and and the influence of, of being judged and it's it, it's just the most timely thing, even though this is 2000 years ago. It's fabulous. You shouldn't be influenced. Well, look what's going on today between Republicans and Democrats and, and, and blacks and whites. You have to judge to the best of your ability on real facts on real circumstances and and um uh, and, and look at all aspects of it I, I i think it's it's magnificent that theoretically our jurisprudence going forward is based on this very nice yes i agree with a bet aside can you hear me now yes yes, yes. What I what I was going to say before is the problem, as I see it, is the is the decision as to what is justice, who who decides it, and how does it work itself out. What's just for one person, we all know, may not be just for somebody else. So how do they get that middle road? That's the question, I guess. That's a very good question, Minya. I agree with Sai because when I was listening to both that bet and what was just read, it seems to me it's very difficult to find a person who can be totally objective and not be influenced by what's going on around him, not necessarily in those days in the world, but in the community. So right. how, do, how do you find someone who's really impartial? Even though further on it gives them, you know, it does give steps as to what you should do in order to not be um, biased in any way. But I would think to find a totally impartial person is a really big task. It's very hard. And, uh, and sometimes you can find people who may be partial and get them out of the system, but sometimes you can't. Miriam. Well, we do have the same thing in our Justice Department today. Exactly. We have problems because people are people, what they are. And if you have a massive bureaucracy, then it, over the course of time, there's entrenched interests and there's different viewpoints and so forth. And what's mm -hmm. the difference between a legitimate philo philosophy of law and just uh, a partisan bias. It's a very, uh, you know, it's a, a very hard to determine or certainly how do you isolate one from the other. Um, other comments on this? Uh, I like, um, uh, Reva. Yeah, I strongly agree with Miriam. I, I think, you know, this issue is so current, even when we just think about recent decisions about the selection of Supreme Court justices. And so what I love about some of this material is that our ancestors were considering issues that are so profound that they're, they're current to this minute. 
and that that's you know okay sigh and then well, uh, <laughs> Bay I didn't Bay think we're going to get involved politically but the way I see it is that we we all have to give up certain rights certain ways the way we do see or accept things and by doing that we reach a uh, a uniform way of thinking that each gives a little and each takes a little and that's what makes the system go so that when when for example today when people object to something they're objecting to something that they agreed upon at some point in time otherwise that wouldn't be there in the first place Okay. Uh, Ray, did you want to say anything? Yes. I think that this section is magnificent. Uh, it's a description of um, balance. And if you are uh, going to, if the judge is going to be in a position of knowing one or the other uh, of the uh, 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 these uh, two composes, uh, compositions, he has to uh, excuse himself. Uh, the only thing missing um, is that today we also have uh, a jury, but we don't have a jury for everything. Uh, I, I think that uh, this section should be sent to our um, jurors or uh, read to them when they become a juror. It's a perfect example of how to be a balanced judge, a true judge. And, and I like the rabbinic quote here, if you come too close, you will be burnt. If you stray too far, you will be cold. The art mm -hmm. of making judgments is finding the exact right distance. And that's really very, profound and it's uh and it's applicable to almost any situation okay um uh, um Inya, you want to continue reading i think Ra raquel had her hand up for you okay sorry rochelle um no i just wanted to say i think that you know definitely this all challenges any character from the two-year-old trying to make a decision you know, where they're going to stick their hand next, you know, uh, to, you know, somebody deciding a life or death situation. But I believe this is why it is so imperative to have the clarification of the laws. If you stick to how they're written, I feel as though it takes a lot of that responsibility of judgment off. If you just follow the way it it's stated. It may not be what you believe, but if you if you follow those rules and guidelines, it, it does help to make the judgment calls a lot easier because this is how it's written and this is how it will be. To me, I guess that would be easier to do. Good. Okay. Um, back to you, Minya. Can I just add one thing? There was a movie, a series on TV not long ago with Brian Cranston, where he was a judge. And he was a very effective judge for many years until it became personal and his son became one of the people involved in the case. And then all of a sudden his judgment went out the window because it was about a family member. So we're talking about a different kind of justice in his case. All right, perspective, is that where we are? Uh, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Perspective mm -hmm. is critical in rendering fair decisions. Independence of outlook and a delicate balance of viewpoint and attitude are essential for arriving at good judgments. Yet how does one achieve independence combined with a balanced viewpoint and attitude? How does one screen out prejudice, bias, and the inclination to favor one person over another? In his presentation to the Israelites, Moses suggests three significant rules for making judgments. First, hear out those with conflicting views. Do not show partiality to low or high Israelites or strangers. And fear no one when you are ready to render your decision. 
Using these guidelines, interpreters of Torah elaborate on the art of achieving justice in human relationships. Rabbi Barakaya, quoting his teacher, Rabbi Hanina, remarks that those making judgments must possess seven attributes. They must be wise, understanding, full of knowledge, able, reverent, truthful, and despise corruption. Because for centuries, each Jewish community functioned with its own dayanim, or judges, who dealt with all personal and communal problems. For example, disputes between husbands and wives, children and parents, business partners, business claims, matters of inheritance, ritual matters. It was critical that the reputation of the Dayanim be beyond reproach. Barakaya's seven attributes offer a high standard for judges and others called upon to render judgments. Rabbi Hanina, a wealthy trader and physician who built the second century academy in the city of Zipporan or Sephorus in the Galilee, also comments about hearing a dispute properly. A judge must not hear the arguments of one person before the arrival of the other person with whom he has a disagreement, nor should one person seek to pressure the judge into hearing him before the other party is present. A fair, impartial hearing is one where the opponents can correct or object to the impression or facts being presented. To allow a hearing with only one of the parties present to prejudice the judgment. Hearing, therefore, means listening to both parties together. Okay, thank you, Minya. Uh, so if you've noticed, Harvey Fields has shifted from the Bible to the Talmud. Almost everything he says here is based on the Talmud. Um, Pam. Were any of the judges women? Oh. Yeah, yes, you had Deborah, you had, uh, I mean, in the Bible or in the Talmud? Uh, yeah, in the Talmud. Well, in the Talmud, well, in the Talmud there was Bruria. There was, a, a, at least from what we know, there were a handful of women who were quite scholarly. There was a very ambivalent attitude toward them. And so Bruria was considered the one of the greatest Talmudic uh, minds and, and a great judge, but there was also certain implications of Talmud that a woman who'd achieved that, you know, was somehow da a danger. So, um, you know, the rabbis had a rather mixed view on women who were too knowledgeable and, and uh, they're, they're, and, and knowledge was a prerequisite for judging. It wasn't, instincts wouldn't be enough. You had to have legal training as well. Turn so, off your... Okay. Who, who are we? Who, who is, uh, where's that coming from, Steve? I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. Okay. So uh, sorry about that. My apologies. Um, Pam. Just to finish that thought. So if a husband and wife had a dispute, it's probably more likely that a male judge adjudicated that dispute? Well, almost, um, you know, pretty much 100%. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, with rare exceptions, the judges were male. I mean, yeah. um, with very rare exceptions. <laughs> uh, so in the Middle Ages, for example, you know, rabbis were male, and again, there was Rashi's daughters who were very learned, but, um, you know, in general, judges were male, and to this day, the Orthodox community is still struggling with uh, whether women can, you know, be given positions of responsibility in the Orthodox religious hierarchy. Okay, um, bye, Amanda. Uh, she has to go pick up her kids. I guess she left already. Babette. Well, also what comes into play is the, a kind of, well, it's not really subconscious, but uh, I was on a, a jury and the, 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 I made a judgment and, and immediately. The, the DAs were cute young guys in suits 
and the, the lawyer for the defendant was a schluck guy in a baggy suit and didn't look like he had a bath that morning. So, uh -huh. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, that, that you do make judgments based on appearance. But also, uh, if a, a, a trial is, is public and there are people sitting in the, the courtroom, they, you make judgments because the people who are on the side of that schlocky lawyer uh, didn't look like well-balanced, ethical, good people that that maybe, right. if, yeah, because they took our names. So there would be maybe repercussions if you found the defendant guilty. So th sure. there are a lot of, you know, it's not even subliminal, but you, you make judgments. So there's a, a and, and there's a whole a specialty where advisors will advise a defendant on how to dress and how to look and when to cry. And, you know, you have these people who've been so heavily coached and they, you know, they get on the witness stand and they cry just at the right moments and everybody's like, oh, we can't send this person to jail. Look at how sad they look. And so there, you can manipulate the system, I suppose. Uh, Sai. Uh, I wonder how applicable the justice system was as it applied to the slaves that they had or people who are not Jewish who are living there? Both very good questions. And so I can take the second one first. Um, there was the, um, the strangers, they were called, who were living in your midst, is the, how the Bible would refer to them. And these were just outsiders of whatever sort. And you know they were entitled to certain degree of protection. And uh, there were certain legal uh, uh, rights that they had. There were other rights that I guess they didn't have. Uh, in terms of slaves, that's a much more complicated issue, but slaves had few rights. But remember that the Israelite version of slavery was generally temporary, I think. And so um, they too had some rights, but not, not others. Um, Bernie, comments? Okay. Um, Steve. Well, I mean, if you go into a courtroom and you have a, a, a prisoner who's brought in an orange jumpsuit, I mean, your, your thoughts are and judgments are, okay, this guy did something really, really bad. So I'm, I'm just going to assume that uh, he's guilty. So again, appearances make a big, big difference. And that's why I guess the lawyers will immediately argue that the defendant be allowed to appear in a suit rather than in a prison dress, because exactly that. Once the jury sees them in that orange, even once, then that memory is in their mind and they associate him with being a criminal. So, uh, you want you want to avoid that image. It's a, it's a complicated thing. It's Pam. That's why my mother could never serve on a jury. Guy in the orange suit would get the death penalty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so what can you say about these this rabbi? So we have Rabbi Barachia and Rabbi Hanina um, that Minya read about. Uh, is there anything that uh, that they say, and particularly the, the uh, seven attributes. Is there anything there that's worthy of comment? Uh, Leo. Okay. Um, well, he's saying that you should listen to both parts and you should listen while both parties are there if you're um, if you're discussing a dispute, because it's not fair to either one um, if if you're not getting a balanced point of view. Okay, so again, it's all the things you would expect on a modern justice system 
they already had, uh, you know, or, or many of those elements. Marsha, Rochelle, or Bonnie? A lot of it reflects on, I mean, it, it just seems like very much the modern way, but I believe that this also probably was true in the in neighboring countries uh, that were like Babylonia and places like, and maybe even Egypt, I don't know, that already had governmental systems set up. And I think that the uh, Israelis were probably taking from the systems that they knew. Uh, and Sai has brought up that question a lot, is how much, you know, what were the other, you know, groups in the, the area, yeah. such as the well, Canaanites and the Hittites and so forth, what were they doing? And I've not been able to adequately address his question. I'm hoping that he'll do the research. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bernie. <laughs> now, Bernie. I find it interesting that in the course of over 3,000 years, the problem of judicial bias still hasn't been solved. They're working on it. They have now uh, robots who are guaranteed to not have biases. <laughs> there you go. They found that uh, guarantee is not true and the robots have biases too. So, I would imagine that I would imagine that the robot has the bias of the the builder built in. And who programmed it? Um, Minya and then Rochelle. Looking back at that list of seven attributes, I think it's a little idealistic to think that you're going to find one person who maybe lives in a shell or lives in a box that will have all those attributes because they're not at all affected by what happens in the outside world. Well, when they have one of these big trials, that's the first question they ask. Have you heard about what happened with this and that? And they always find a few people who claim they never heard about it. Exactly. Yeah. Or they haven't seen yeah. any newspapers or watched any TV. Well, they don't have a TV. They don't subscribe to newspaper. They don't have the internet. They, they live in a cave. That's right. And they don't know anything. Rochelle. Rochelle and Marcia. And inside. Okay. Um. I don't. I mean, it's it's just human nature to have opinion. It's it's human nature to judge. But again, when you're looking at something like the law, and other people's lives are at stake, depending on what you decide. Again, it's being able to separate yourself from your own personal thoughts and being able to execute the rules and regulations as they are written and as they apply to the situation. It's, it's, not, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to see somebody in an orange jumpsuit come in that was convicted of stabbing someone to death because they happened to be at the scene when it happened. However, you have to separate yourself and listen to everything. Maybe this person was walking by right after it happened and he was wanting to help somebody and he stayed at the scene. Now he's convicted or get, you know, looking to be convicted because he just happened to be there. It's being able to separate personal self from hearing exact, I, I guess, hearing both people's sides as it states here and being able to make those calls, how the law is written, not how we perceive it should be. And that's really hard because, you know, today with DNA, they, they have people who were convicted and then years later they go back and they find the DNA doesn't match. And so the person couldn't have done it, but you know, this is long before you have that. And so you have to just listen and use your, you know, you have cases where people confess and then it turns out they were innocent. So why did they confess? Well, maybe they were tortured, but even in cases where they're not tortured, they sometimes people conf confess. Why they would confess to something they didn't do, I don't know. But, you know, so it's really an art rather than a science. Okay, um, um, Marsha and then Sai. Well, I've and been on a, uh, I have to make sure I'm, 
I've been on a Law and Order binge on TV, so you <laughs> into this law thing. But nowadays we have this system of recusal where if somebody is personally involved, they really aren't supposed, and I don't know if they did back then have a situation where if you were personally involved or had an interest in um, a judgment that you were to take yourself out of the picture and let somebody else do it. So hopefully they did because, I mean, you can't expect anybody to be making judgment, a, an unbiased judgment on something that they had personal, uh, a personal stake in, you know? So I think that can, but I think so much of these laws of the ancient societies, whoever wrote them, say, whether it was the Jews or people that they lived amongst and they saw these other rules and took them to themselves. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing how much of our present day uh, law system goes back that far. We read it and it doesn't seem foreign to us because that's the same thing we're doing, you know? Hi. Uh, I think it's absolutely amazing that the people who had spent 40 to 50 years in the desert were able to come up with a jurisprudence system. Uh, they had no contact to any really large extent. But when they left Egypt, they certainly were not exposed to a, a judicial system. So it's my feeling that over the years, uh, when people have read the Bible or, or reading certain things, they were adding their experiences into the Bible as to what was going on. Uh, they uh, had contact with certain civilizations that had a judicial system. And so they were putting it into the reading. And this is what we're reading now. Uh, Rochelle. Yeah, I just wanted to mention also, um, which I can I can appreciate, and I see what size point is is on that as well. Um, which you can appreciate that Judaism had written very specifically. You know, people can't be convicted of things unless so many people had witnessed it, um, and things like that, which was kind of really good, but then again, also very bad. Uh, so that was why, kind of hmm? why bad. Um, bad because if someone, if there wasn't that many, you know, if there wasn't three people standing there or two other people standing around when a crime was committed and only one person saw the crime, then that person is more than likely not going to get convicted because it's not meeting the standard that was set. Um, I guess that's kind of, that would be where, you know, someone would have to and I guess go against what I was just saying, um, you know, you'd almost have to, it would almost be your own judgment call because it's not meeting, it's not meeting the criteria of the way the law was written. So it, it, it lays on your conscience, on your judgment at that point. Okay. Um, who else would like to say anything? Uh, Leah. Leland and Miriam. Didn't they, didn't, I just did, didn't they pass through a whole bunch of cities and, and intermingle with other people during that 40 year period? So they could have picked up some of the best attributes of what they saw during that time. Um, that's true. I mean, of course, we're talking here about mostly in the Talmud, which is the first, second, third century CE. So it would be literally. 1300 years after the exodus. So um, I don't, I mean, I don't agree that these ideas necessarily developed during the exodus time. It could have come about many, many, many hundreds of years later. Uh, Miriam. I bet it was very difficult to find judges in that time. Because what if a person judged erroneously and someone died because of him? He had to live with that for the rest of his life. It was, wasn't it difficult to get judges who had all these 
this knowledge and were wise and had everything they wanted a judge to? It's, uh, and, and you know, and doesn't have the bias. I mean, if you've got uh, a co a cousins who are working in import export, and you've got an uncle who is, uh, you know, got this uh, wo wo uh, car wash business, you're biased. You've got relatives who have certain economic interests. If your wife is pushing you to do X, Y, or Z, you're biased. Who judge who? Who chose all these judges? Well, um, the, um, originally Moses, you know, you know, and then, you know, then there was uh, a, a, a hierarchy in which uh, judges were chosen by, you know, some of the elders, whoever they were. So it was, it was a small enough system that everybody could be, you know, everybody knew each other, you know, of the leadership group. Uh, and they could pick people that they presumably thought they knew and that they trusted. But as you know, if you were teaching 20 students, if I'm teaching a Torah study group of 17 or 18 people, I, I may get a certain impression, especially over Zoom, that somebody's really you know, responsible and then we make them chair of religious practices committee and then six months we've got a big problem because they're pushing for all this crazy stuff mm -hmm. and you know, people say but we were in Torah study every week with them for years and we never would have thought so exactly that's what I'm yeah, driving in. you can't always know what's going to happen people you know unless you know a person really really well and even then you don't know what surprises they may they may spring on you Marsha what Miriam is saying is no different than now. You know, a judge is going to bring to his judgment, his calls are going to be influenced by who he is. And that's who you don't know who he is. Exactly. But that's then and now. It doesn't much matter. I mean, it, it, I know, I know, but that's the trouble with the whole system. Well, then what? Then take away the laws and let everybody run rampant. I mean, you have no, to. No, but there has to be something better. Well, if if we really thought about it. Well, how do you take the human element out of judgment? I don't know. You have to think and come up with something plausible. Well, you have to hope that somebody is going by whatever the law that's written is there. I know our Justice Department is in, in trouble. Well, it's not the only one. I'm sure I know. England, you know. They're all the same. I mean, they all have the same basic laws. You know, mm -hmm. whether the only thing maybe is uh, capital punishment, maybe one of the differences, and maybe in the Arab or Arabic countries, they are more anti-feminist, let's say, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, this is gonna, it's a universal truth. It's, you just have to start with something and you have to hope that it's going to be uh, an honest judgment. And you, there's always an appeals court. Now, now, do we all agree this last paragraph about Rabbi Kanina saying that you shouldn't uh, insist on talking to the judge before the other party is there? In other words, you should wait. Um, so if I arrive 10 minutes later and I'm appearing before Judge Katz and I say, Pam, hi, let me give you a brief rundown, you know, beforehand. And and I shouldn't say that. I should say, Judge Katz, even though we're friends and everything, and even though I'm here early, we're going to wait for the opposing party to show up so we can do this properly. Right. Uh, B, B and then Sai. Yeah, I need to explain why I left Torah for so long. I got a call from my eight-year-old grandson from Prague, Czechoslovakia. Oh, wow. And then wow. nine hours ahead. So he was, this is before bedtime. So of course there was a no decision decision and I spoke to him. Uh, so well, welcome back. Uh, and uh, we're, we're still talking about the potential for bias and the need to try to have both parties there at all times and uh, so forth. Uh, Babette. 
Um, the, the thing is too, that these were judges, um, the, the disputing parties didn't have separate lawyers as we do today. Um, and um, what happened to me once is I was being questioned by a lawyer um, for some black kids who were accused of holding up housing authority police. And I wrecked the whole trial because the, the, the lawyer asked me if I lived above 96th Street in Manhattan, you know, implying that those who live above a certain area are uh, living differently. And sure. that- That's funny because I lived in 95th yeah. and we, we did see 96th Street as like the border. Right, right. Well, I lived on 99th. And I, I, I said it, and of course they discharged me that just because I live above 96th Street, it doesn't mean I can hold up housing authority police. So I wrecked the whole thing. <laughs> uh, Marsha and then Cy, and then we'll go on. Marsha, you have to unmute. I said I lived over up around 190th Street and 200th Street, so it's a little different up there. So and it isn't, you know, it's, it isn't Harlem, which is what they were all referring to. But also, I don't think they're mentioning lawyers. They somebody comes up and they're speaking on their own. There is no some, but there is no one to speak for you unless you ask a friend to do it, I suppose. But I don't. Th this was before the lawyers, so. Maybe things were better then. I don't know. <laughs> if there are any lawyers on the page here? If I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry, you have to unmute. He's lost with the muting business. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we're forgetting a basic concept, namely that you must have a law for the judge to follow. Uh, you don't set up a judge in an arbitrary manner and let him make any kind of decision. You first give him a standard to work with. And if you don't have a law, the system is not going to work so that uh, whether the Israelis had laws first or not, I don't know. But in any kind of a jurisprudence system, you're working with a law. And that's a very good point. And, and this is what I was uh, implying earlier, is that the biblical laws here are only partial. And so you see that Harvey Fields jumps without really saying that he's jumping from the Bible to the Talmud. And much of what we have here is Talmudic discussions that date from 13 or 1400 years after the Exodus. So, and that, and the Talmudic law definitely is a coherent legal system. Uh, Rochelle, and then we'll go on. No, no comments. Okay. Okay, who'd like to read um, Babette? We're on page 100 in the middle on the left within Jewish law. And we're talking about the issue of how to hear, hearing. Okay. Within Jewish law, however, hearing means even more. If for instance, one appearing before a judge wishes to bring more evidence or enlarge one's arguments, one must be permitted to do so. A judge must be patient, even if the parties are long-winded or the case is tedious. Disputants must not be cut off. They should be heard to the end without intermission. The judge should also ask questions, seeking to go behind words and to get to the truth. Hearing means paying attention to nuances, inflections, and possible manipulation of the facts. 
Rabbinic law is also sensitive to how those who made judgments view their eyes. Judges should not look at only one of the disputants. If they do, they must give the impression that one is more important than the other or that one's argument, clothing, gestures, or physical appearance is more pleasing than that of the other. Such an impression could lead, uh, lead to the assumption that the judge is also showing favoritism even before a decision is announced. It may also result in a person's leaving a hearing with the conclusion that the judge's eyes were constantly on my opponent. He favors it. He never paid any attention to me. Commenting on the appearance or, or partiality, Rabbi Moshe ben Chaim Alisha warns against allowing the dress of disputants to influence judgment. Because one is dressed in fine clothing, the latest fashion is no reason to favor that person. A person should not go away from a hearing saying, had I worn better clothing, the judge would have heard my case with greater respect and sympathy. For the Al Alicia, sh should judges fear from their reputations will be weakened if after hearing all the arguments, they decide to refer the dispute to others or to a higher authority to admit one's inability to reach a fair, knowledgeable judgment is not a sign of weakness, but of strength, welcomes Alicia. Furthermore, those are times when it is, there are times when it is impossible to reach impartial conclusions or when the person called upon to hear the case may not be expert enough to comprehend all of the information necessary for a fair judgment. Okay, thank you, Babette. Comments? Marsha, Bernie, Sai, Nan, or well, Marsha? This, this is what Babette was talking about before, of having people come in and not one looks better than the other, that, you know, um, uh, in appearance, and clothing, and demeanor, and so the judge might be partial because of that, and that's exactly what she's saying. So things don't change over two thousand years, you know. Uh, and you heard the the story about the two bar. There's two barbers in this town, and one of them has this beautiful haircut, and one of them has a bad haircut. And which barber do you go to? The one with the, one the, bad, with the bad haircut. haircut. Because the other, you know, they had to give each other that. Okay. Um, other comments, Minya, uh, Steve, Bernie, Leo, anyone? Lorraine's been quiet today. Okay, she's smiling. You have to unmute, Lorraine. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. I've often thought how extremely difficult it has to be to be a judge. To have someone's life in your hands is, to me, most probably the most difficult job, even more difficult than a surgeon who has a whole backup team uh, and the operating room with him. Um, and also, there's so many studies done about people going in for a job interview and how people make a decision in a matter of minutes, maybe seconds, on how the person looks. It's amazing how much judgment is passed on appearance or dress. And that's what this is talking about. The wisdom in these pages is amazing. Um, but if you have to interview 10 candidates for a low level job, and one of them dressed nicer than the other nine, and you have to make, you don't want to spend three weeks making this decision, what other choice do you have? 
You mean what are the tools you have at your disposal to judge? Perhaps how they speak. Uh, do they seem like people that are kind and will respect orders? Uh, because it's a low level job doesn't mean those skills don't come into play. And Okay, Cy? Uh, I think it's interesting that the discussion revolves around the judges and, and the system uh, understands that these people are fallible and that's why eventually the jury system was put in to somewhat override the judge's partisanship uh, and make it much more uh, uh, legal and uh, democratic, if you will, by having a jury. Yes, I agree, Sai. Miriam. Miriam and then Nan. Again, we are, we are going back to our forefathers. Uh, remember, they went to a higher authority. So do we. We, if we, they can't make a decision, what do they do? They go higher. We have the Supreme Court and so on. I think, I think that's one way they were able to get out of a very difficult decision. Okay. Um, uh, Nam and then Leah. Um, going back to something Lorraine said, um, when I worked uh, in Arizona, the dress code was a little more relaxed as opposed from coming from the New York area where things were a lot more formal. And I remembered seeing people in the cafeteria, even though we it was basically a call center and we weren't dealing with many customers on a face-to-face -face basis. And I would always think, don't these people have mirrors or look at themselves before they walk out the door? Um, and I had a girlfriend of mine and we had very similar things. And we had the attitude, you dress the way you want to be perceived and what your aspirations are. And this is a gal that, you know, except for casual Fridays, she wore a skirt or a dress and heels. May have been, you know, sleeveless, short sleeved, a little casual. I couldn't go that way every day because I can't wear heels. But, um, you know, I dressed nicely. I dressed for an office. At, because I took the assumption, you never knew if somebody, a vendor or somebody was going to come in and see you. And you just hope that people who make these decisions are looking at the resume and listening to what the person says and not solely making a decision based upon the outfit they're wearing or the color of their hair or how many piercings or whatever. Um, and so that's just been my, uh, it's been a motto and I try to instill it to my kids and my grandkids that, you know, you are perceived as to how you dress and how you look, whether it's fair or unfair. And so you should always try to be as good as possible. Uh, so the emphasis here is to as much as possible to emphasize the judges are obligated to uh, retain as much impartiality as, as humanly possible. Okay, other comments? Then we can go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we're in the right column on page 100, commentator Jacob Ben Isaac Ashkenazi. Of Yano, who would like to read? Uh, Bernie. Okay, then. Commentator Jacob Ben Isaac Ashkenazi of Yano notes that showing partiality is not simply a matter 
about how judges hear a dispute, but also how they speak to those arguing before them. If a judge speaks pleasantly to one person and rudely to the other, Ashkenazi warns, he may influence the emotional state of both disputants, encouraging one and discouraging the other. In fact, such a demonstration of partiality may make it more difficult for the parties to present their cases, especially for the one who assumes that he, for whatever reason, is disliked by the judge. Pressuring or signaling displeasure with disputants may influence the way in which they present facts. It may cause them to become <coughs> so confused that they neglect important elements of the case. Judges, therefore, must do nothing to indicate their preference between contestants. Okay, then this is from Santa Rana that we mentioned before. Oh. This is the Yiddish commentary written in Eastern Europe for women. Um, what what uh, when I when I first saw those TV shows where they have the Judge Judy or Judge uh, there's a there's a whole bunch of them and that that it seems that one of the hallmarks of those programs is exactly that that the judge decides who they like or who they think is right and then they 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 behave toward the the other party in the most disdainful and sarcastic. Uh, an obnoxious manner, and that you know is kind of entertaining, I suppose. But I, I always found those shows almost unwatchable for that reason, because the judge uh, seems to be exactly doing what they're not supposed to do. I don't know if they're real judges or not, but I, I don't know how they could be. Bernie, you know, I read this paragraph, and the thought occurs to me is, well, duh. I mean, it's intuitive. Why they spend so much time writing about this is beyond me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, a lot of this is, from our point of view today, common sense, one would think. Um, uh, Miriam. Um, Miriam. Uh, that I was thinking just as you were reading, they're reiterating and reiterating, going over and over the same thing, really. It's right. done throughout this uh, Parsha, this part right. of the Parsha. So in the, the next page, you know, that we won't have time to read all of it, it deals with impartiality from different points of view. Now, I suppose, though, if you're an expert on legal issues, then understanding every aspect of impartiality is very important. What to Bernie and myself is obvious uh, has to be clearly stated each aspect of it because, you know, it's important for the judges to remember, ex you know, uh, implicit bias, uh, uh, unintentional bias, uh, indirect bias, so things that you don't think are biasing may indirectly have an impact on, on the case. And again, we're talking about a time when there's no DNA evidence, there's no crime labs, there's, there's no, there, it, it really, it, the, the justice depends almost entirely on the judge getting it right. Um, Pam, Ray, Steve, Riva? Yes, Sai. Uh, Reva. I have to unmute. Okay, Riva, and then yeah, I I just find this section so remarkable. It it's initiated by Moses trying to develop an ethical co code for the society for the future, you know, and realizing that he can't do all that judging himself. And then right after that, it shifts right over, and that's that's part of part of the Torah. Then it shifts right over to commentary. And we're looking at commentaries over an enormous period of time. And I think writing or editing this section must have been a total nightmare because they're trying to cover so much material uh, uh, by a whole array of commentators over an, an enormous period of time. And so we have yeah. all these. Anyway, that's and it. 
and Harvey Fields, uh, you know, he puts in three or four pages. Uh, 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 you know, it goes all the way from the from the book of Deuteronomy that presumably was written around the year 600 BCE, all the way to uh, Joseph Hertz, who died 30 years ago. And so you're talking about uh, 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 2,600 years of commentary and uh, judicial development. So it, it's a tremendous amount of time. He, what I don't like, which I, I, we, we have to accept for this commentary, is that he, he does uh, switch from biblical to rabbinic sources without really explaining how different it is that there, there's a huge gap in time and mentality from one to the other. And, and he just kind of ignores that fact. But, but I think we can fill that in. Uh, Sai. I think one of the problems they face is to be sure that the people themselves have faith in the judges. And that, that's a, a, a full-time job. If the people didn't have any faith in them, the whole thing certainly would go to pot. Now, what about Sai in the case that I'm, I'm moving ahead because we're not going to obviously read the whole thing at the bottom of 101 that um, uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, the founder of neo-orthodoxy in Germany before World War II, talks about the uh, issue of threats against judges. Um, and, and I just came back from Bogota, Colombia, where that was a very real uh, problem, you know, in the 1970s with the narco-traficantes and even today. How does a judge handle potential or real threat made against them, you know, that could, um, you know, influence their lives or, or you know, or, or even something like Marsha? I think optimally he removes himself from that situation and lets somebody else judge because otherwise he is going to be unjust in his judgment because uh, he's uh, letting somebody else dictate uh, what he's going to be saying. And the only way out of it is to say, I'm not dealing with this. Somebody else okay. has to do it. So if you, if you refuse to be influenced by the threats, you might be biased in the other direction, plus you might endanger your life. If you give in and you're going to be biased in favor of the people making threats, that's not justice. So the only solution is to say, I just won't. I can't, I, I'm biased because I'm being threatened and I'm just going to let somebody else handle it. Of course, they're going to have the same problem. Uh, Minya. Well, I was going to say that if it's a particular case and you feel that you can't handle it, then you can recruit recuse yourself and have another judge appointed, but you can't do it every time a case comes up if you can't be a judge and handle things that may have a little, you know, that may have a threat, maybe you shouldn't be a judge. I mean, you really can't just walk away just because you don't like a particular case. It could come up in another case. So how do you make the distinction? Can you be a fair um, juror, jurist or do you have to walk away? Marsha. Marcia. You can't put your life and your family's life in danger uh, to be doing this and in, in doing this job. If um, the whole community is a bunch of crooks who are going to threaten you, you know, I don't think judging is for you. you know? Right. So then you walk away from it entirely. Exactly. You can open a car repair shop or something. Sai <laughs> and well, it and seems to me uh, that the, the system has to uh, uh, incur the people who are going to make the threats in the sense that the punishment is going to be pretty bad for those people, should they be caught. And that's what keeps them from threatening the judges. That's what we have today. I mean, if you threaten a judge, they throw the book at you. <clears throat> uh -huh. So it requires a strong civil society that can right. back up the judge. Um, who's next, Minya? Or Bernie? I just want to mention one thing. There was a judge in New Jersey whose husband and son were killed 
No, the husband. Uh, the husband lived. Larry just said, because the son opened the door, and he was right. immediately murdered, and she yeah. went back to being a judge. So she was a pretty strong person to be able to do that. Pretty recently, I remember this. Yeah, months ago or something. Wow. Yes, it's. Uh, that was an unusual case. This was a somebody who she dealt with, and and he came back to get revenge, right? Right. Exactly. Um, Pam. That's right. Pam. Uh, what, I, what I took out of this parsha is here's Moses. He's at the, you know he knows this is the end. He's gonna die here. He's got he's got so much only so much time to get his final thoughts to his people before. You know, they go off to the promised land and he doesn't. And here it is in the first part of Deuteronomy, he puts so much emphasis on the judicial system and judges. To me, is a sign that he thinks, okay, this is how you guys are going to keep order in the uh, in your in your new land is through the judicial system. And I think so it's, it's his way it. of dealing with what, how are they going to handle things after I'm not here? Right. And, here, and, and you know, uh, we saw that uh, all the uh, protests in Cuba, and a lot of that is clearly due, due to the fact that Fidel Castro is not around anymore. So when people don't have enough food, they get mad. Right. Before, when Castro was there, it was like having your grandfather around you just accepted well fidel yeah. wants to know what he's doing and you know even if he doesn't we don't have the nerve to to repudiate him to his face but so a working, those, yeah a working judicial system just helps prevent chaos and here you know they're they're heading off you know to the promised land and you know moses doesn't want them going into chaos mm. and so he's saying okay you guys got to use the system but I took uh, um, yeah. I wonder, Rabbi, that after Moses has done all this work and <clears throat> stayed with the with the Israelis, with the Israelites for 40 years, worked hard, so forth, God doesn't permit him to go to Israel. Why? What's the thinking there? Well, we've talked about that before. You know, the, the rabbinic explanation is that he struck the rock instead of talking to the rock. My explanation is just that God wanted that entire generation out of the way. And indeed, we understand in modern society that each generation has to give way to the next generation. I just got a call this morning from one of my former congregants in Alabama. And she's saying her grandson's moving back to town and she doesn't understand him. And she says, this younger generation is inexplicable. The things that are important to them, she just can't understand. And I think we can all identify with that. And when we were little, we thought that about our parents and grandparents. They're so old fashioned. What are they thinking? And so now we understand that different generations have different priorities, whether it's better or worse is a value judgment. Clearly, we think our, our way of thinking is the best and the grand, grandchildren are nuts, but nuts are not, they're the future. So I think Moses just had to give way. I mean, if you let him continue forever and ever, you don't have any progress. You don't have any change. I mean, that what kind of what kind of Israelites are that? It's just everything will be always Moses, Moses, Moses. Uh, Miriam, isn't Joshua the one that leads them into? Um, all right, isn't he of that generation? Uh, no, he's younger. I thought he was of that generation. He's, he's younger, so he's at least 25 years younger than Moses. Yeah. I mean, he may have been, he may not have been a spring chicken in our terms, but he was definitely, um, you know. Second generation, yeah. You know, it is true he was on the older side. So they didn't, 
it's a, and Mo, so Moses did not turn it over to um, you know to uh, a, a rebellious youth. You know he picked someone with as much uh, experience and age as possible. And Joshua's uh, secession was in the making for a very very long time. So Miriam's correct, uh, but but he's still seen as the at least a step forward a little bit. Any other, uh, Lael, and then my final question is any other, you know, broad conclusions that, that emerge out of this? So Lael and then Miriam. I just have something to say, if I can do it. I just became yesterday a great grandmother again. So I'm all excited about that. Mazel tov, mazel tov, Miriam. Thank you. Well, don't we need another opinion? Um, I mean, Moses was around and he was a leader for a long time, but we can't make progress when we're following one route. You have to kind of look at different ideas and different people in order to, to grow and progress. Right. So it was his time. His time was over. It's time to look at another point of view. Well, they, that's what God has done. He's told him to choose somebody to lead them in. And he chose Joshua, correct, Rabbi? Correct. And, uh, um, and, and you could see that this was an inevitable progression. As Pam said a few minutes ago, Moses couldn't handle everything going on anyway. So not only is there a passing leadership to Joshua, but there's also passing the judicial responsibility from one person to a whole network of people. So uh, so we would even say that it's not Joshua who's taking over, it's all of these judges from a justice point of view. So um, other final comments, Pam, Bernie, Rochelle. Pam says no, Bernie says no, that leaves it up to Rochelle, the responsibility falls on your shoulders. Uh, she doesn't want, her shoulders are not that broad. Babette, Marsha, or Sai or Nan. Okay, well, um, next week we are going to, uh, th th this week we talked about a very abstract, broad theme of justice. Next week we're talking about the Shema. So it goes to the ritual side and a very specific side. Uh, if you want to do homework, and I'm sure that you're all eager to do many hours of research, but the Shema is easy enough to research. You can look the Jewish Encyclopedia online, which is uh, published in 1904, but it's still very good. And you can, of course, go to Wikipedia, uh, which is ongoing, published as of 10 minutes ago. And there's just a lot of sources about the Shema. If you want to write to me, I can send you. I have a whole ebook from Nor Rabbi Norman Lamb on the Shema. There's tremendous amounts of materials written about just a few words. And we'll, we'll be talking about that next week. Okay, over to you, Steve. And everybody have a great week and hope all is well. Yeah. All right, let us conclude with the uh, final blessing. Baruch <laughs> Blessed is Amen. Bye-bye. Everyone have a fabulous week, and uh, we'll see everyone next week. Thanks, Steve. Bye-bye. Reva, put, uh, unmute Reva. Where's Reva? Is there uh, a question? Did you get my email, Reva, about uh, marketing? Um. I sent you, you, you here. me yesterday. Yeah, let, let me double check, Marcia, because I've got a, I've got a bunch of them related to that. You, you sent right. me the, did you send me the, um, I, no, I think it was, uh, um, Andre just sent me the, 
Oh, well, wait a minute. You're plan we're planning to talk on Thursday? That's what I said, yeah. Yes, yes. Basically, I, I remembered that Faye, and I guess Andre, has all the email addresses for all the newspapers. We were talking oh. about, because Reva's going to be taking on marketing with a committee. Um, I got I that. Called it, I called it publicity, OK? Yeah. Andre right. sent me the spreadsheet. OK, and I, you basically going to have to go back and get all the mastheads or go online and get re-investigate as to who are the editors for the local newspapers. Somebody's got to do a group contact list. And when you do articles to send out, you send it to all the newspapers, except the Arizona Republic, which you have to do online. And OK, are we still talking on Thursday? Yeah, I'll still call you, but I wanted to make sure you got my email. Okay. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And and I was just thinking I got the other one from Andre with, with the with the spreadsheet. Yeah, I just remembered that this morning and I said, Oh God, I don't have to do that. Thank goodness. No, it's all done. It's all done. Okay. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to talking on Thursday morning. Marcia, don't uh, leave yet. Marcia, don't leave yet. I have yeah. a question to talk to you about. Hey, I know what you're gonna I'm say. cutting out. Are you, you okay? Marcia, you still, yeah. I'm here. Okay, uh, I was gonna to talk to you about the Kubota War. I know you were. <laughs> oh, you did. Because that's how, what we how, talk about. <laughs> how, okay. how, did, how did you know I was gonna ask or talk well, about Well, I was thinking about it, but at this point, I think we have to wait till after, obviously after high Yeah, I, I agree, but I think we should start planning it now or soon. Um, I think yeah. we should do, plan it we should, the awards usually give in February, March. Right. We should right. plan a meeting, even if it's a Zoom meeting that Andre can pull together, which is wonderful. Um, if he could do that uh, in December, maybe. Right. And then, well, what I was thinking is, you know, of course, we the presentation to uh, the past, the just recent participants or re recipients has not actually been. Uh, I call it, you know, formally awarded. Right, and we wanted uh, and to do it in public. I would like to do it in public if we could, uh, right after the holidays. Okay, and, and, do and it, obviously yeah. at a service. Yeah, well, so, either yeah, a service so then, or, then you're or, saying there will be two this coming year? Well, I'm thinking the previous recipients, we do honor them like after the holidays. And then the new recipients do them in February or March. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, who were the previous recipients? I did the last ones. I don't even remember. Bob, Bob, and um, Judy. Judy. Okay. I think that um, Brenda had worked with Judy. She had, Bre Judy asked Brenda to help her out. Bachner. Okay. And Bob, you were going to do. Uh, no, I think it was the past. Um, Mike? Oh, who is? I don't know. I, I'll have to look, look it up. Yeah. And also, too, on the plaque, their names never were put on. No, because we just lost last I, year. We had to. I know. So, but anyway, uh, I thought we'd get something moving, you know, not necessarily right now, but in our back of our minds, we need to start moving on it. Okay. And get it in in October before we run into yes. Hansa. Yes. <laughs> yes. But I don't, you know, it doesn't have to be a Friday night service. It could also be a Sunday, you know, thing. Yeah. If you want, like after one o'clock. We know, could do Sunday and we could just have coffee if we want to have coffee, coffee and a cake. And not coffee. a whole. Own egg with right, you know, just, just liver and everything. You right, know? just like a uh, uh, like coffee, tea, Cook and maybe uh, cookies or, or cake. Yeah, cookies is easy because you don't have to deal with forks. <laughs> right, right, that's true. But you know, we've got we got we've got plenty of forks. We got I know we got forks, but that means cleaning up. I mean the cleanup is easy. Right. Well the cleanup is is you know that's no big deal. My idea was that if when we started doing Onyx was to avoiding the contamination situation was to put a uh, place of uh, cookies or cakes on tables assortment uh, on a table and then people could get a cup of coffee and sit down with whoever and whatever instead of doing oh, okay so just 
have in like uh, trays of cookies on each table. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Good it's idea. Much easier that way, you know. Yeah. Okay. And, and well, uh, we can we can discuss it further. I'm not going to be in charge of doing cookies. So, uh, Yolanda absolutely refuses to come back at this point. She's not comfortable doing it. Okay. So, okay. Well. And uh, so we'll just have to deal. I mean, it, setting up coffee and tea is nothing. And if we do these, do the uh, the, you know, plates, then uh, you don't. I don't like the idea of everybody standing on that line getting their food. Okay. And I agree. People, I, I mean, agree. I was vaccinated. You probably were. I was vaccinated. But yes. we, people are not going to admit that they didn't. And right. Uh, and you just don't know. You really just don't know. Exactly. But, you know, it's, it's not a thing we want to be confrontational about. Exactly. Exactly. So the way to avoid that is to <laughs> give them their food in a different way. That's all. You know? Well, and, and we can do that. We can do that. And of course, a lot of things will change between now and, and, and yeah. October. All right. But so, are you going to go take care of the plaque in the meantime? Uh, I can. Um, the thing is, I think we're running out, we ran out of space. So oh, I'm going to have to get to new apps and, oh. and see if we can make room. You know, maybe get a different Another position for them. Do they hang them down below one below the other? Yeah, and we've got both. You know, both of them are full. Oh. So, anyway. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I think we should do it on a Zoom meeting. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. And um, uh, we can. I, I have the list. It's actually on the desktop on my computer here of everybody. Okay. Things, well, so. We we need to uh, contact the temple to find out when we can do this on the calendar. Okay. So I guess we'll check with Andre about that. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to be gone next week, as I said before. Right, and, and I'm going to be gone the next uh, the 28th and the following Wednesday. I'll be in Kansas City. Oh, so you're? I'm looking at the calendar here. So you, yeah, um, I will be gone. So you're gone the 28th and the first week in August. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. When you come back, we call me or whatever. We'll be on. Well, we'll, we'll be on that Wednesday, and we'll yes make contact. Okay. No All problem. Right. I don't know how we got this job, but Steve. But <laughs> <laughs> Permanent. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then we it's 